Hi. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome back uh, to the Georgia Tech uh, Fall Lunch and Learn Lecture Series. Um, my name is Dr. Dalidi Brown. I'm a Senior Research Faculty Education Workforce Development Director with the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute, or GTMI. Um, I'm excited to continue hosting this series and encourage you to please spread the word so we can spread uh, the news and add value to the GTMI community. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I'll first introduce GTMI and just give some brief instructions for the audience. GTMI is one of 10 Georgia Tech interdisciplinary research institutes that uniquely focuses on manufacturing research, development, and deployment. We help tackle the grand challenges of today's manufacturers. This is partners in moving innovations from the lab to the market. GTMI has a wide variety of facilities and equipment located on main campus for basic research, uh, as well as on 14th Street uh, for more applied research in our Delta Airlines Advanced Manufacturing Pilot Facility. GTMI's mission includes education and workforce training, collaborative partnerships with industry, academia, and government, as well as thought leadership. GTMI's AMPF is the headquarters for a groundbreaking initiative called Georgia AI Manufacturing Technology Corridor, or Georgia AIM. Uh, this is funded by a recent Build Back Better EDA grant worth $65 million. Georgia AIM is expected to profoundly impact Georgia and the nation's economy through the equitable development and deployment of talent and innovation in an artificial intelligence for all manufacturing centers. The AMPF currently has state-of-the-art equipment in metal, metal additive and hybrid manufacturing, and is currently expanding and transforming into a demonstration facility for automated smart factories that incorporates IoT, AI, digital, and robotic manufacturing technologies. GTMI hosts the Lunch and Learn uh, lecture series each a lunch and learn series each semester. These sessions are excellent opportunities for Georgia Tech faculty, undergraduate, graduate level students and researchers, as well as the global manufacturing community to learn and share advanced manufacturing knowledge. Today is our fourth lecture uh, of the fall semester. Um, and we're here in person and streaming online. Um, we have a, a, a good presentation today. I'm very excited. And um, we want these sessions to be interactive. so. Please feel free to chime in. Um, I believe uh, our lecturer has quite a bit of information to deliver today. So you, you may wanna jump in when you can and ask your questions as there may not be a lot of time at the end of the presentation to, 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 answer, to ask questions. So um, if you have a question, you know, uh, jot it down um, or, or go ahead and raise your hand, ask your question. If, if you're online, please uh, submit your questions in the chat box um, and they'll be addressed promptly. Okay, today I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Ahmad Hassan, uh, who will discuss data-driven scalable composites manufacturing processes. Uh, Dr. Hassan, you can stand this way in the camera. Okay? <laughs> Dr. Hassan is a group leader for the Composites Innovation Group in the Manufacturing Sciences Division at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He is leading ORNL's development efforts in high-rate manufacturing of advanced composite structures. Dr. Hassan is also leading ORNL's molds and dyes manufacturing portfolio for the composite manufacturing industry. One of his leading efforts is to, to develop a vision and strategies for smart manufacturing of polymers and advanced composites, aiming to advance the US competitiveness in the global market of manufacturing. Dr. Hassan contributed to the creation of a new market for additive manufacturing technologies uh, by developing a new class of composite feedstock materials for large scale additive manufacturing systems. He has expertise in a wide variety of composite manufacturing, uh, characterization, qualification methods, and he is currently managing several technical research efforts with a large funding portfolio uh, in this field. Dr. Hassan is mentoring, supporting, managing a group of undergraduate graduate students and postdocs and fellows, uh, postdoctoral fellows, and junior and senior staff members as well. Uh, Dr. Hassan has served on the board of directors of the American Society for Non-Destructive Testing and was the chairman of its research symposium from 2020 to 2022. He has published 90 plus articles in high impact journals and proceedings, holds several patents, has received three R&D 100, 100 awards, and was named the 2021 Society of Manufacturing Engineers Judd Hall Composites Manufacturing Award recipient, in addition to other multiple honors and, and technical awards. 
In the following presentation, Dr. Hassan will shed light on several examples of scaling up different manufacturing processes, such as thermoplastic and thermoset additive manufacturing processes, compression, compression molding for automotive parts, as well as the facilitation of pioneering integrated polymer manufacturing processes. One of the foremost advantages offered by data-driven manufacturing lies in the capacity to foster continuous improvement. This talk will encompass different data-driven scalability aspects ranging from material development, advanced materials characterization, system integration, data analysis, and economic considerations. Through the accumulation of systematic analysis of data over time, manufacturers can identify trends and pinpoint opportunities for refinement, both within the manufacturing process itself and in the end product. So after that lengthy introduction, <laughs> too long. Dr. Hodgson, you may begin your presentation. Thank you. So thank you so much for being here today. And uh, I will not introduce myself because this is very long, actually, introduction. <laughs> I was not expecting that the entire bio would be read. So <clears throat> my name is Ahmed, and uh, I work as a group leader for Oak Ridge National Lab. So, by show of hands, how many people know about Oak Ridge National Lab? Ah, okay, cool. For oh, you, you don't know. Oak Ridge National Lab started back on the, with the Manhattan Project, basically, back on the days, right? So every dollar for the Manhattan Project, if you watch, uh, basically, uh, Oppenheimer, right? This has become relevant now. So every dollar on there spent on this project, 60 cents of it was coming to Oak Ridge National Lab, right? So we developed, as you can see over here, just a, a quick historic tip. Uh, this is not only the campus, there is the SNS is this way, the, uh, uh, and the Hyfer is in that way. And you can see Y12 is over there. If you can see, you know, uh, it's over there. So why I'm saying that actually during the war, they come to the ridge, the, uh, the uh, the, uh, the code name actually for the city, for the Oak Ridge city is the secret city, right? So they built two factories. They built the X10 and Y12. Y12 is a still a webinary laboratory for the Department of Energy. However, the X10 uh, lab uh, become uh, Clinton National Laboratories and become Oak Ridge National Lab. And we shifted our mission from, we still do nuclear, but from webinary to Sciences. So the, we are the largest department of energy national laboratory of science, basically, right? Office of science. So as I said, it started with uh, construct the world first continuously operated nuclear reactor back uh, during the Manhattan Project. And if you got for you did any X-rays or MI uh, or, or MRIs and stuff like that, most probably you used an isotope that it was developed by Oak Ridge National. So who we are, we are about $2.4 billion expenditures annually. Uh, we are about 6,000 employees right now. We, this is not including the visiting scholars and visiting researchers like yourself coming and working with us for extended period of time. We publish prolifically. Uh, one, you can see a lot of accomplishments over here. We have the most intense neutron source in the world. Um, we have the most powerful supercomputer in the world. And above all of this, we have been mentioned on the Big Bang Theory. Mm -hmm. So Sheldon hacked into the framework, which is the, our big mainframe, to be able to do something like very stupid, right? So, mm -hmm. so this is the most powerful supercomputer. This was an Oak Ridge National Lab. So we do a lot of work in advanced characterization. SNS, as I said, uh, uh, is uh, SNS and Hyfer, uh, high flux uh, reactor, based neutron sources and um, we do a lot of work on frontier, next level exascale system. I always get embarrassed when I say this because I don't understand it still because I cannot grasp the number still. It's one quantillion calculation per second, right? So I, I cannot still comprehend that, right? So this is the most powerful open source software that uh, currently exists. And we are material development lab. We do a lot of material development a lot of material development. Most of the harsh environment materials that goes into NASA missions has been developed a way or another at Oak Ridge National. All of this is good. Where do I work? Not on this beautiful campus. I work outside of the campus, right? So I work in 
this facility over here, as you can see, this one, actually my office is on, on the side over there. So this is an off-campus facility in Knoxville, not in Oak Ridge. It is about 20 minutes from, from Oak Ridge National Lab, the main campus. These are two, three buildings, the National Transportation Research Center and the Grid Center. Just if you look a little bit, it's MDF, Manufacturing Demonstration Facility. This used to be our old building, but then we grew it a lot. So we moved to the big building over here, which is Manufacturing Demonstration Facilities. This is where a lot of manufacturing research is happening, right? And I will talk about most, uh, a lot of time, uh, most of my presentation, I'll be talking about the work that is done with this facility. So this is basically the manufacturing uh, demonstration facilities. The mission is to, as we are a global leader in creating, uh, developing, maturing, and transferring manufacturing research and technologies. Big words, right? What does this mean? We move technologies from fundamental levels, TRL, low TRL levels, to higher TRL levels, and health and cluster equivalents. Right. So basically think about this bay as your Disneyland for engineering, manufacturing engineers, right? They go there, they play, they innovate with companies to be able to get the new technology into the market over there, right? And by the way, this was three years ago. If you go there, a lot of things are moved and new technologies came in. Yes. What is TRL level? I'm going to talk about it and please don't interrupt. Uh, <laughs> Uh, by the way, Pam is one of our senior researchers at uh, Tokyo Natural Lab, so this is why I was a little bit a jerk with it. But <laughs> he's one of our senior researchers. Prefer to chime in. Yeah. So as you can uh, as you can see, collaboration and training. Um, we do a lot of collaboration, a lot of training. This is this slide is relevant to here basically because we do a lot of in, uh, talent pipeline. We host a lot of students, and I will. Show a barcode at the end of my presentation. Please take advantage of it. We have a new program that it can host a lot of uh, interns, right? From undergraduate to graduate to even a research faculty, uh, visiting faculty programs that they can come and join us over here, right? We work prolifically with, with industry. You see, I always say industry, industry, industry. Just put this in mind. Whatever that I'm saying, it has a reason, right? Just keep it, work it, and we'll go back to it. So we, we have about five pillars over here at the MDF that we work on the manufacturing demonstration facility. We have additive manufacturing, composites, machining and machine tools, hybrid processes where you combine additive and subtractive at the same. So where is the fit? It's over there. Digital manufacturing, AI and data analytics, right? This is the thing that you will not see when you go physically on the building. Right, but there is a lot of work is being done, including modeling and simulations and analytics and stuff like that on the bank. Right, as you can see over here, well, we will be talking just about composites today. And composites, actually, we have quite a bit of the space at the manufacturing demonstration facility. We have large equipment, and we have, um, as an example, polymer characterization lab over here. This is one of the most highest advanced. Polymer characterization labs, we have everything on there like TMA, DMA, T, NEA, right? DC, FTIR. So you can come up with uh, a polymer that you don't understand anything about it. And then a day later or so, you can come out with this polymer completely analyzed and you have a lot of data out of this, right? So in the composite science and technology sections, we are four groups, basically. We have a composite section, we have four groups on the section. We have a section do deal with extreme environment material. We call them the dark side people. Most of their work is on the dark side, which is uh, DOD, uh, Department of Defense, the stuff that goes to space, the stuff that goes super boom fast. And we have a sustainable manufacturing where we actually, this group is focused on uh, biomaterials, recycling, upcycling, downcycling, and all of these good stuff. We have advanced fiber. We have another facility, another 20 minutes outside of Oak Ridge. Uh, which is a football field long. It is uh, a football field long for making our own carbon fiber, low-cost carbon fiber, right? And I will talk about the Composite Innovation Group, which is our group, which basically we focus on developing scalable, disruptive, high-rate composite manufacturing solution. All the presentation today is about scalability, right? Let's talk about scalability. So the, 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 the vision of our group is to develop state-of-the-art scalable high-rate advanced composite manufacturing technologies integrated with data-driven to create multifunctional object and tailored functionality for certain applications, right? Again, just 
remember this. TRL level, Dr. Kim asked this question, right? What is TRL level? Who's familiar with the TRL level? Oh, oh. Okay, so it is technology readiness level, which a term that, or a concept that NASA come up with to tell you where is your technology fits, right? At which stage? As an example, if I'm a professor at a university and I got a great idea, it is just an idea, and I want to have a small proof of concept, and I did it at the lab and I proved it that, oh, you know what? The math add up and it will work. This is anywhere in, sorry, this is anywhere in TRL one, two, three. And then four, five, and six, and seven, we are going up the chain, right? Which is basically technology development and prototypes. Right now, it is not only a concept is enough, right? I need to prove that it is working. So this is basically TRL level four to six. Six and seven, this is a little bit different in, in terminology. One is you have a demonstration article, and this demonstration article is being tested within a lab environment. This is six or within a real environment, which is seven. That's mean that I tested it in my lab on a simulated environment and it did good. Now I'm handing it to Ford or Boeing, right? Doesn't like test it at, at the environment, right? And then basically eight and nine is basically market launch and commercialization and stuff like that. So TRL one to three, knowledge development, four to six, technology development, seven and nine basically is all reliance on business development, you have to acknowledge the business case, right? Let's talk about scalability. Most of the low TRL levels are done by academia, national laboratories, government laboratories like NASA and others, right? Most of the high level is done by industry. There is a big gap. We need to, to, to bridge this gap, which is collaborations that it needs to happen between the government entity and the industry. Okay. This is an interesting graph. As you can see, uh, funding and investment is the y-axis and manufacturing innovation is the x-axis. This is what they call is the this valley, the scale. Really, a lot of good professors like here in Georgia Tech, they do amazing technologies. Since at three, industry doesn't know if it will work or not because there is no demonstration for it. I cannot have a feel, does it really work? And in other cases, I don't have a bandwidth on my line to disrupt the manufacturing line for production, basically, and try and go and play with your things. It doesn't work. Or I don't have even the funding, as you can see over here, the funding is low, to be able to support these kind of ideas, right? This is where technologies or ideas dies, right? Which is not good. So this is where the scale up happens. So the scale up is what? Is it linear process? Is the scale up is a linear process? So let's say if I develop something very small and I want to scale it up on an environment. A lot of people, and this is why I'm, please jump in because I have a very long presentation. I'm trying to summarize 10 years of work in, in, in just an hour, right? I will show you, you, all of you are familiar with 3D printing, tabletop printers, right? If I want to scale it up to have a bigger part, is it just scaling it up, making a bigger gantry, or that's it, right? Because in my head, scalability, like, oh, you know what? There's a gantry system, make it bigger and have better motors so I can accurately locate where I'm, where is the nozzle is. Hold them these thoughts, right? Scalability is not linear. So basically, this is what we think, right? Scalability is, there is a scalability in multi aspects, material scalability, process scalability, application scalability, and system scalability. It can be a linear process. System is just, yeah, some cases, the system just needs to be bigger. So you can just scale it up, right? Would I reach my goal? This is a different issue. You reach a goal. Is it the goal? I don't know. Material, you can have a little bit of wobbly thing, but you instead, you scaled it up. Did it reach to the goal or not? I don't know. This is how actually it looks like, right? This is how actually it looks like. To be able to reach to a goal, it needs to be interlaced, interleaved. Right. And you go up, you think that you went up to TRL level six or seven, 
and then you say like Ugh. and you go to go back to TRL one again, right? Because the material is not compatible with the new system, right? So let me take you for a ride on there on one of the good cases that we have at Oak Ridge National. First of all, just to show you scalability, can we do it at Oak Ridge National Lab or not? Yes, we can, especially I'm talking about combatants. Why? We have a world class capabilities, large scale printer, smoke, small scale printer, compression molding, plasticator, thermoforming, injection molding, you name it, right? So as an example, even at the scale level, we have a 300, uh, sorry, 35 ton injection molding machine. We have a 330 ton injection molding machine. I have an employee sits on the surface at the scale of research facility at Michigan State that they have access to 3,000 ton machine, right? Compression molding, 100 ton at the lab, 500 ton, 4,000 ton. You can walk in between the plat, right? Literally, you can walk in. So we are very well equipped to be able to do this kind of research, right? Scalability. Let's talk about system. We will take the not the sense the uh, sense the uh, censuses approach. We will take the siloed approach, right? We will just have a system. Cute printer. I have two of these at home, right? And then I want to make it a little bit bigger. Which, yeah, it can work. I'll just scale up. But now I want to go to this kind of system, which is basically thirty meter long. Thirty meter long. In freedom units, it's about 90 feet, right? So it's about 90 foot. Can we go to 90 or over 60 feet printer that it can print real big option? Uh, how can we enable this vision? We had one of our engineers back on the 1995. He said like, what if I can 3D print concrete? Just back in 1995 that it is coming back now, right? So like, yeah, put an articulated nozzle, on a robot, or sorry, on a gantry, right? And then you deposit that. Okay. Currently, going back to the small printers that you have at home, or you have it here at work, right? At the university, <laughs> you have an nozzle, right? That you can eat the filament, right? To be able to make a part. So fundamentally, we need to move from a nozzle to extruder and from a filament too. I'm that crazy. I got an extruder with me actually. <laughs> so, but this is a screw over here, uh, an element from the extruder. And you have these watch your hand. And this is the pellets. If you don't understand what these pellets are, these are the pellets. Actually, basically, it is a material that is instead of filament, you have pelletized material on there that actually it has uh, it, it is compounded in in a very small element that you can send it through the extruder and this extruder will be at multiple heat zones and then you are increasing your throughput basically this is the aim of doing that so as you can see over here the biggest system at the time was a stress machine about 36 uh, inches by 36 inches and then we said like you know what let's get the system everything will work fine right we need a gantry we need to push more material so we use extruder we developed the extruders that it can go 40 pound per hour, sorry, 10 or 12 pound per hour, which is insane, right? And we did that. Uh, we call it a blue gantry. This is just a uh, uh, black and white image uh, for dramatic effect showing that it is so old, right? So it is. <laughs> it looks blue in reality. So we were happy and we scaled it up and we started to deposit ABS material similar to what you have on the small thing. Guess what? It worked. Significantly, we didn't manage to print more because it just like peeled out and you have crash, right? So this proves my point that if I'm just focusing on scaling the system, was I successful? Yes, to scale the system. Did I reach my goal? <coughs> no, I did not. So we need to think about material. How can we develop a new material that it can go along with the system? So we said that, okay, this warps a lot. If we add, we need to reduce our CTE, right? The coefficient of thermal expansion. How can I reduce my coefficient of thermal expansion? Compound something that it has low CTE. So we added carbon fiber, which is almost has zero CTE by itself. When you add this over there, and you can see that you print the same exact object, it has no warpage. So we fix the material problem. We fix the system problem. 
interlaced. Are we successful? Yes, right? Hold for this. So we decided to build a bigger system with a company, uh, the system called the big uh, area, additive manufacturing, right, at the time. So the big area additive manufacturing, this is where the industry needs to come in. You remember the chain, the collaboration? We have a good fundamental concept on the blue gantry. And then a Cincinnati anchor company in Ohio, they said like, what if I give you, they are very well known, it is a machine tool company, making beautiful, precise gantries, right? So like, what if I give you a laser cutting machine? Can you make it in a printer? In six months, we will be able to transfer this to the first large scale additive manufacturing system. Hooray, now we are rolling. Let's take it and go to a conference and start printing a demonstration article. What demonstration articles that you want to print? And by the way, it is 12 foot by six by three, high deposition rate up to 40 bounds per hour, 40 bounds per hour, right? Moving from 10 or 12 to 40. Let's roll. Printing a car, are you crazy? Yes, we are. Do you want to print a car? <laughs> yes, we printed a car. And then you can see how beautiful it is. A lot of cracks, right? I'm big into emojis, right? So you can see this. Getting so frustrated. What's going on, man? I did everything right. I scaled up the system. I scaled up the material. I went back and modified the system based on the material. Yeah, but you didn't scale up for a process, right? Processing itself. Okay, after grieving, crying, going back to the whiteboard again. Let's think about the process. Let's scale it up. We put an IR camera on there and we found that even we are printing fast, it's still the substrate is when we start printing an actual component with a very long layer time, the substrate drops down below the TEG of the material. You don't have enough heat of fusion between the layers. So it says you are printing something hot and something completely cold. So what's gonna happen? It will crack. So now we understand the process. Process here means optimizing for layer time. And the layer time is dependent on, let's get a little bit technical on, Heat transfers. Heat transfer depend on thermal conductivity, heat capacity, and geometrical aspect of your part. Thick walls are completely different than thin walls, right? The heat transfer is completely different, right? So what do we need to do? We go up to 100 pound per hour, increase the throughput more. So instead of this small screw that it is going around, I don't know where, don't, don't, don't take it, it's a government. By the way, it is a government property, so if you take it, you are in deep, deep trouble, <laughs> right? So, but we moved from this up to an extruder that is almost half of my size, like a really, really large uh, a screw, uh, 100 pound per hour. Can we print a car? Yes, we can print a car. Does it look good? Hell yeah, it looks beautiful. <laughs> beautiful, right? It's at the Department of Energy uh, main, main uh, and it is electrical, so it is drivable, by the way, right? So it is uh, signed by Bob uh, Bodendrand, the guy who won uh, the race by the Shelby Cobra. Yeah, uh, I don't have time, but I can tell stories about what he did. He's 80 years old, and he was driving it as, as it is a real car, by the way. Um, so we created a new industry, as you can see from there, when we interlaced everything together, right? So we interlaced the process, the scalability, system scalability, material scalability, and then you introduce completely new market from a blue gantry to uh, 35 pound per hour, to 100 pound per hour, and new companies start to get in, 46 foot, 300 pound per hour, and we are targeting 500 pound per hour with University of Maine. This system stays at University of Maine, actually sits at University of Maine. New other technologies spun off and thermosets and hybrid action. So this is a brain teaser for you because I know a lot of you are, are graduate students. We didn't solve everything. These are still challenges on there. Anisotropy, surface finish, interlayer properties, functionality, system. What does this mean? I will pick one because it's the sake of time and we can talk more about each one if you want to later on. Anisotropy, what is anisotropy? Properties are not equivalent in each of right. the directions, right? Why I have anisotropy on there? If I have a filled composite system, 
which I have carbon fiber or glass fiber, whatever fibers going in through a nozzle, this nozzle is elongated and I'm driving it in a certain direction. So I have a simple shear profile in a nozzle or on a pipe, think about it as a pipeline. So I will have very high alignment of these particulates on the direction of the deposition. So if I have a 3D printed bead, it would be highly aligned in one direction, right? Uh, sorry, properties are high in one direction and weak in the second and very weak on the interlayer and interfluid. So how we can think about reducing this anisotropy or use it for our benefit, right? Uh, surface finish, it is a thing. It is not all good and dandy. Whenever you go faster and bigger, the beads are really big. And when the beads are really big, that's mean that your surface finish is not good. So you have to have a secondary operation like machining or something like that. How we can get over that, right? So in Oak Ridge, we do a lot of research on all of these, right? If you're interested in one, I will go in details, but I will pick one or two and I will talk in details about it. This is just a brain teaser for you too. As graduate students, still there is a lot of possibilities on that, right? I mentioned like application. We didn't talk about the application. Now we have the system and the system is good, right? And we printed a car, a demonstration article, right? Okay, <clears throat> what kind of applications that we have? You can do the car, you can do a submersible vehicle for, uh, it is a wet submarine for Navy SEALs, or you can print a house, you can print tools. There is a lot of market, hydro, wind building, fossil transportation, nuclear, whatever. There is three killer applications for large scale additive manufacturing, which they are tooling, tooling, and tooling, right? Uh, so let's talk about tooling. There is a lot of tooling research on that. I'll take my group lead hat and I'll put the tooling additive, uh, the additive tooling hat as, as a lead, right? I spent a lot of years on this and uh, it's painful. So uh, let's go through my agony together. So we, we agreed that we scaled up everything perfectly, right? On this case. But tooling, if I'm doing an, an, an out, of, out, out of autoclave tool or a trim tool or a room temperature tool, whatever you want to call it, Requirements are easy, right? It's similar to the car, basically, right? I just need to machine it, make surface finishes good, try to maintain vacuum integrity, coat it, stuff like that, right? But Boeing came to us and they said like, hey, by the way, I need a tool that it can work at 350 F, 100 PSI. These are the autoclave requirements, by the way, right? And I need vacuum integrity, 28 uh, 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 mercury, right? Surface finish of 64 and a low coefficient of thermal expansion and minimum touch labor, low material cost, 10 parts. And I, I, it's a big list for God's sake. Like, I don't know what else they didn't add over there, like a gold plated and, you know, keep, keep adding, right? Keep adding stuff on there. <laughs> so we need to focus on one thing on there. So what is the biggest hurdle on there? It's not the system. It is not the processability. It is the material. The material that we are using is ABS. ABS, PG is around 95 to 105 basically, TG. That means that if I put it in an autoclave for 350F, it will just crumble, right? So we need to move on the polymer uh, pyramid uh, up, right? From commodity to engineering on high performance, right? High melting point range, high uh, TG, uh, better uh, heat deflection temperatures, this thing is jumping. So we chose two uh, materials, two material systems, one amorphous and one semi-crystal, right? And we said, like, let's do the basic material science and engineering work. Let's load them up with carbon fiber and see how much we can lose. So we got the, as an example, the PPS, we loaded up from 40, 50, 60. As expected, we were thinking about like 40, 50, 60, right? But you can see the 60 got a dip over here, right? Why? The matrix were not able to wet the carbon fiber as it's supposed to be. As you can see here, there is a lot of dry fiber bundles on there. So we got a hit on our mechanical property. So our optimal sweet spot is 50%, right? So after loading it with carbon fiber, it's like, hooray, let's work, let's go, let's, uh, let, let's put it on. And before we do that, for sure, we do a lot of characterization, right? So these are the kind of characterizations that we do. We do uh, rheological, rheological uh, characterization to be able to understand the 
the viscosities of the material, the shear thinning behavior of the material, the G prime, if these terms are a little bit complicated and you don't know because you are an MSE, not an MSE, contact me afterward, I can spend time with you, right? But G prime as an example, just to take one, this is the storage models, right? So why it is important, can the bead hold its own shape and can it hold its own consequence loading on top of it, right? So you have to be within a certain range, right? But then we said like, yeah, let's load it up. And we load it up and then we were printing. I remember this print, I kid you not, this print was 1 a.m. at the moment, right? And something happened on the print and I went out and we left it a little bit, five minutes, went back, fix the thing, go back, run the printer. Run the printer, doesn't wanna run. What's going on? Freeze. Does one or not? What's going on? We don't know. It's just material, man. It's just injection molding grade. What's going on? Yeah, dummy, it is an injection molding grade. This is why, because in injection molding, you are using a reciprocating screw. You are not in a dynamic process that the, your, your, your screw is already prime and always prime on there. What happened? Oxidation. It oxidized, basically. And then the viscosity shoot 600% over about half an hour, which we overtorque the motor. That become one piece. We have to take it off, burn it off, and go back. So this shows that even for material development, we went to a company that we are working with, we did heat stabilizers, and for some time till we get a new compound, we print it in an inert gas environment. We, so we're purging uh, gas in there. One other thing that we need to focus on as well, right? So now for tooling, CTE is very important. After we fix all of these viscosity problems, we print it. But we need to understand the CTU of the tool, the coefficient of thermal expansion, because as soon as you put it in an oven or an autoclave, it is no longer the same dimensions. It will just grow, right? And your composite parts that you are molding on it is completely off. So we need to understand that. So how you measure CTE? Using a method called TMA, right? So to be able to do a TMA, your sample is this big, right? Five by five by seven. Guess what? Your bead is about half an inch. So, and you have a distribution of fibers on there. Highly aligned, random, highly aligned again. So it depends on where do you get your samples from? So now the reasons that I'm saying that scalability right now didn't only affect the manufacturing method, it affected the characterization method as well. The current standard characterization method is not valid currently because where should I take my samples? I have very heterogeneous material and CTE is an intrinsic value of a material. I can get some values and average, but would this mean anything to the modeler of the tool? Most probably no, right? So what we did is we developed with University of Tennessee another method, which is cube two inch by two inch by two inch. And we did DIC to it, right? So DIC right now, you are not measuring a CTE as an intrinsic value but you are lump sum as well, the void content, the void between the layers, the effect and the interfaces between the layers. And this value is more important for the modeler than an intrinsic value of the bead because it doesn't mean anything for him. And you can see the anisotropy over here, we just played with 00, 0, 0, 090, which basically different raster pattern. And you can see that 20 to 95, 110, but again, it moves from 110 to 173, right? just by playing by your, your uh, rastering band. So if you do DIC, you can see that even you can catch <laughs> the beads by the strain map on there, right? We discussed about you have high alignment and you have low alignment and then high alignment again on the bead, right? And this is the interface. You can, you can get with this new method, right? You can get actually a, an actual CTE value for the bulk of the material and instead of an intrinsic value. So this goes back to the scalability. We had to invent, not invent, to uh, implement a new method of, uh, of uh, testing. So we gave it to uh, Boeing. We tested it. We scaled it up. Vacuum integrity. Got the composite part out of it, as you can see. And it was already, this was a success. This is when we said that we are done. So now you can see the scalability. When the four things interlace together, you get these results. That means that in some cases, uh, uh, when I stop here for a minute, you see that we thought that we are at TRL level seven. It's ready for the industry to go and get it. No, we went back to the whiteboard, we went back to TRL level two, 
right? So it is non-linear process. It is non-siloed approach to be able to do the scalability sciences, right? We move to a compression molding process. We started with just one. Uh, I wanted to show here, your loading is this way. Again, fiber orientation is this way. So this direction is very weak. So if I'm printing it, I need to print it in this way. So I get a better fiber orientation in that way. So I get less deflection on this way, right? But here is the thing, compression molding, you are not putting it in an autoclave and everything is good by convection, it's heating up. You're heating by conduction from the backside. And you have a big block of polymer, which, you know, the thermal conductivity of the polymer is great. Great is, it has the best thermal, being sarcastic by the way, right? So, so just to, if you didn't catch the notion. It's bad, thermal conductivity is so bad. So if I'm heating just by conduction, I said like, okay, let's put, uh, I was so desperate. Just let's put an insulation box. Maybe I will get there at the temperature, right? And then you put a deck and everything and it's said like, you keep braying next to it for about three hours and then you fail, right? Because the thermal conductivity fundamentally, even in Z and you see, first of all, it is an isotropic, right? But even the best among them on the ABS is about 1.1. And the BPS was 50% carbon for God's sake, right? It's about 1.4. It's nothing, it's nothing. Like good luck to heat up this tool. So how we can scale it up? There is two approaches. Either I move the heating source near to the molding surface, right? Or enhance the thermal conductivity of the material. So how can I move the thermal conductivity uh, move the heating elements. So we created a method that we can co-extrude wires during the three printing processes, right? As you can see. Mm -hmm. So we co-extruded wire during the three printing process where we can just do joule heating, right? So you can, you can basically wire it up from both sides, send electricity, and then you, you heat up the entire tool. And we did with some feedback control and stuff like that. And we managed to get less than about five degree difference on the heating surface, C, which is quite good, right? Uh, we did our typical material science just to see the distribution, are we depositing it where it needs to be? As you can see, these are, all of these are wires. And as you can see that we did mechanical testing to see if these wires are getting giving us a hit on the properties or not, which we found that yes, it is dropping our modulus and a little bit on the UTS, but why? Because actually, we literally get an off-shelf wire, nichrome wire, and we put it in one of our material. We didn't condition the wires. We didn't condition the material. We didn't do any surface prep for the wires. So basically there was no good adhesion between the matrix and the wire. And then it created an inter inter interfacial gaps and interfacial sites that as you can see over here, this was like really intention because there is no load transfer actually. There was no load tra transfer. It just matrix start to the crack propagate and it separated the matrix, but the wires are still tacked on there, right? It is not the end of the wallet. If your tool will not need more than 60, uh, 60 megapascal uh, UTS or seven, sorry, seven gigapascal uh, on, on the stiffness, you are good, right? You design for what you have, right? Uh, when you scale it up, as you can see, this is a part of a wind mold, wind turbine mold. And we heat it up, as you can see, this is all of the wires over there. It was, and this is a box and you can heat it up and we get up. Uh, this was with the University of Maine and Ingress. Thermal conductivity, there is a paper on there if you wanna read it. This is just an understanding of the thermal conductivity of different material systems on there. And I intentionally had some of these labels on there because of the proprietary aspects of the work. But let's say we added some voodoo dust on there. So we added some voodoo dust on there uh, and thermal conductivity enhancers. Just to, to be, this is the most that I can say about this, but uh, it's because this is not commercial yet. So you can have an increase in properties, right? About 300% most. So a combination between this and your wire moving it very close to your molding surfaces, then you can have a good heat tool, right? Um, this work is basically by uh, Pumpkin, uh, Pumpkin over here. And this is basically an application for tuning. We said about like differential on CTEs and how you can predict the CTE, right? So he developed a, a, a modeling framework that 
it can account for the torturous path of the 3D printing. And then you can activate element by element and assign anisotropic properties for each element. And then you can predict the growth of the tool or the shrinkage of the tool in this case. And then you create a new machine file that you can machine it down, right? And so when you throw it on the open table in the oven, it will grow anisotropically to the desired uh, dimensions on there. The other methods that I talked about, you can randomize your fiber orientation. So we created multiple, um, we studied uh, multiple elements on a nozzle. We printed a nozzle that we can disturb the flow. So it is no longer a simple shear flow, simple shear flow in a pipe, right? To be able to reduce the anisotropy. And you can see in the X and Y as an example, it moved from 300% to 11% only, right? But still, the Z is still high, right? It's going to be a little bit hard to completely get it in. So now it more like an orthotropic rather than it is completely anisotropic. This is another uh, example of uh, cooling. If you need to, it's a little bit dirty, but uh, your engineers, I suppose that you, you are okay to touch uh, the stuff that is sticking. But this is, uh, this is a dissolvable tool, basically, right? So we created a material with Mitsubishi chemicals, as an example, to build mandrels that it is dissolvable. So you can put tape layup on top of it, and then after doing the tape layup and wrap up, and instead of putting it in an acetone or something like that, that it is very uh, not, uh, it is very dangerous health-wise, right? In big quantities, you can just put put it in aqueous solution, and you just like you can you can dissolve that. This is just another example. By then, by then, after five years, we went through over a hundred and twenty different formulations of materials that we played with, right? So now it's scalability plus application plus process. So now we understood the additive manufacturing very well. We hope so, right? Can I, um, uh, can I do it for a certain application as an example for, this is work of Palm as well over here. And by the way, Palm is a GTEC graduate, so it's good. Uh, so these are wings that it is uh, designed and built. Um, so what is a fundamental problem over here? Because I don't have a lot of time over there. But what is a fundamental problem? You have uh, a certain, uh, let's say a wing, that it has a differential on the uh, stress field. So you need to have a high, the high stress field correspond to a tighter mesh, while uh, the low stress field should be more wider meshes, right? So if you develop that, you we developed that, uh, an algorithm, uh, circle backing algorithm, and then you triangulate it, and then you do the dual graph, so you get your hexagons on there, uh, and then you can separate it. You can say like, okay, this is a large uh, circle needs to be here, and the small circle will be there. The main problem is there is a transition is very rough and crude, right? There is no natural transition on there, which by itself can cause a stress concentration problem. So how you can do that? As you can see here. We developed an algorithm that's called uh, iterative backing, where you can have gradually uh, changing or sectioning, which you have two sections with a clear uh, transition, or you have iterative and sectioning, which basically the transition will be a little bit smoother, basically, that uh, it can carry the loads. And as you can see over here, when we load it up, uh, three printed wing and fill, right? And, and you can see that it can take same weight, same size, but it can deflect less. Okay, we developed that small scale. Let's scale it up. What is scale up? Let's see. Tom over here, when he was young and energetic still, right? So just fresh out of school. <laughs> but you can see we did that. We did over there, but we built like three layers and we start crashing, right? Why? Because you have all of these 3D printing. It is hexagons. You stop. So something called... Uh, M, uh, 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 so the travel itself, right? You have travel, and when you go up, let me show it better. In let, and a smaller scale, you have a retract. Like when you print, you can apply retract, so the material will not ooze out. On the large scale, it oozes out, and when it oozes out, it makes like spikes on your print. And then every time you go and print, now it's just solidified. So it is crashing points, right? So how we can get rid of this? So. Common team developed a continuous uh, 3D printing algorithm, right? So to reduce the amount of empty travel, right? So we don't have this oozing when it goes to a launch, 
right? And as you can see over here, this is a good uh, graph. He developed it using the Chinese Bossman problem. Uh, basically, how you can minimize the visit for certain locations by using this algorithm. As you can see over here, all of these blue, by the way, this is the empty travels. So we print and then it's like move empty, move empty. And all of these are locations for oozing, basically, right? But you can see it's, it can still, it will go for a little bit more, right? But for sake of time, you can see, but when we did that, now you can scale up and you print something that this is, how, how big is this? About seven, 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 foot, seven foot, about seven and a half foot here. Yeah. So now we are talking about integrated processes. We understood the additive very well, and we understood the other conventional processes very well. So what we can do, can we, basically, if you read this, you will see the next section, I will spend five minutes on it very fast, but using advantage of a process to overcome the disadvantage for another process. So now we scaled up a certain technology and we are in control of it. Can we marry it with another manufacturing technology to get something that it is completely new, right? So we develop uh, the motivation over here is in molded composites, injection molding or extrusion compression molding processes, you don't have control over your properties. This is why you don't see this molded composites in aerospace industry. You cannot predict your fiber orientation. You can predict it to a certain degree, it is flow dependent, and you, know, you can simulate it in a way or another, but you cannot control it. You can control the gate locations, the runners, but you don't have even a control over your thickness, right? You will get this shear flow as well, and you don't have a control. So as an example, we did this oil pan with Ford Motor Company. This is a big charge. It will naturally, when you go and compression mold it, it will move this way and that way, right? So you will have highly anisotropic, non-controlled properties in your oil pan. Right? So you design at your minimal allow on that right, on the weak spot. So just to prove that as well, you can see that in a simple blade, right, six inch by six inch, within one blade itself, you have different stiffnesses based on the orientation. Uh, if it's a 14 by 14 and you have a charge over here, that means that I will develop a flow when it goes over here to the heads of the wall, so we'll have high fiber orientation next to the wall. So most probably I will, I have like about, it's about 36% difference in stiffness in one blade, right? So how can I control that? We said like if we marry additive manufacturing to compression molding processes, maybe now I can have a control because additive, we, we, we discussed that I have high fiber orientation on the alignment direction, on the deposition direction, and I have the robotic or the slicing or the tool bathing, whatever that you want to call it, so I can strategically locate my fibers in an oriented way, right? Whatever I want. So this was the concept, as you can see, we didn't have a good uh, 2020 uh, artist uh, to do our graphics, uh, but this was 2020. This is reality, sorry. But this is 2022, right? So we built a system. It is a robot that it has a, a 3D printer on top of it, an extruder, and the mold shuttle in and out. Uh, so this one Camex award last year, and uh, we just won the R&D 100 award for it this year, All right? This is a speed up uh, video, as you can see. Um, and this is real time, as you can see over there. Um, but after this is, is doing zero, and then it will go and do 90. In molded composites, you cannot do that. You cannot control it over the, the thickness of the power. So, more toys. <laughs> So this is not the best uh, choice ever because, by the way, all of you are invited. Chemex is uh, is down the road over here. This is a big show of composites. And our team actually took most of the good goodies over there. We have a booth on there, right? So, uh, but you can see, now you can have high control. If you are into the composite and you saw composite all the composite before, this is almost impossible to see. You will always have high alignment, high alignment, a random in the middle. Right? right now I can control it. Anything look elliptical, that's mean that the fibers are going on this direction. Anything that it is a perfect cross section, that's mean that the fibers are coming at you, right? So this is basically 0, 090. And when you see the strengths and models between the extrusion compression molding and the preform unidirectional, I can increase my properties. And I can, even when I do 090, 
I can control. So I can basically, the idea over here, I can tailor my performance across the thickness, right? And tailor my microstructure on there. Can we do overmolding? Can we integrate it with additive manufacturing? Yes, we can. So you can do uh, metal additive manufacturing, and then you can injection mold over it, or you can, um, uh, or you can basically injection mold over it. Why you do that? This is good for joining, as an example, right? This is a project with Ford. This is half of the cross car, car cross beam. You know what is a cross beam on the car? Your dashboard is carried on a car cross beam on the back. It is metal, so you want to make it out of composites. But because it is attached to the A-pillar, now it is challenging to attach composite to metal. What if I attached, um, I get a shape that it can be interpenetrating network, right? With a design mesh that can take the load and I can over mold it with composites. So now I don't have to do metal to polymer. I will have to do metal to metal, right? And the rest of the metal is basically engraved or actually weaved with composites itself during the molding process, right? Uh, additively reinforced art, this is what I'm going to present on uh, next um, on, on Wednesday. Actually, we developed a new process that we have a patent on it. And instead of printing out of plane, because this is, needs a lot of calculations and math, what if I print it in 2D structure and just I, I, I draw it or, or thermoform it on top of, uh, of, on top of a mold, right? So right now I don't have to do any um, complicated how to blame printing. So in this case, as an example, this is an airlift mobility example, right? Where you have a, a spinner cover and they want to have uh, an impact of a bird that it is two and a half kilograms with 200 miles per hour, right? So that should crumble just two thirds of the way uh, before it hits the engine. So what we said, like we are gonna get a sheet. We, we, we do the uh, calculation of the impact and grid structure. And then you can design your grid structure for the impact performance on there. And then you can, uh, you can do that. It's the same thing on the thermal sense. So when we talk about data-driven composites over there, it is basically, you can see all of these are data, right? That we are generating. The next thing that we are trying to think about is the digital twin of it, right? Digitalization. Can we add sensors to all of these processes? Can we collect all of these data in a digital form? Can we train? machine learning algorithms and, and, and through like either like validate an FEA model and you use a set of data to train the machine learning algorithm or even use the experimental data if it is big enough and valid to be able to train this. And then you can reduce your design cycle or in terms of design or optimization and uh, so, so on and so forth. So uh, this just to show that we work with the entire supply chain material suppliers, uh, end users, and equipment suppliers. I want you to take your phone out, check this, because this is, uh, we have educational program on there. We have an intern, uh, in, uh, internship, and uh, vesting faculty programs. I think the deadlines, some of them are approaching very soon in December, and some of them in January, right? So I would love to see you at the lab. Uh, so um, please come and join us because it is just, is literally three hours away from here, uh, up north and the beautiful mountains of uh, Smokies. So I want to see you over there. So at this end of my presentation, thank you so much. I, thank you. Thank you. I that was not that fast and you gained something from what I said. Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of content presented. I appreciate this, this overview of a lot of topics on composites and I think uh, I think we we can go over maybe five minutes for those who can stay to ask a, a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Um, does it, does anyone have a, a pertinent question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, so Dr. Hassan, um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was very cool and very informative. Um, so you mentioned the data driven part of that. Is there any efforts already underway right now? Uh, yes. Talk about it. Yes, there is. Um, we, uh, and again, I focus on the scalability over there and stuff like that. We did a lot of data driven work in the additive side, not with the conventional side. So, yes, we have IR is attached to, and, and Tom and his team did uh, 
uh, did uh, optimization for uh, for layer time based on, on data coming out of the IR uh, cameras. Uh, we have profilometers that they are attached to the uh, to the head as well to be able to capture the uh, the bead uh, width and size and stuff like that. And yes, all of this had been fit to. Uh, right now, it is a little bit simple machine learning algorithm, but we are trying to increase a little bit and a little bit the degrees of, uh, of complexity. On the I didn't present it over here because this work is still not published yet, and I don't want to. Just before all of what I showed published, so you took picture, do whatever. But this work is still on the process. So yes, and if you wanted to come for an intern or anybody, yes, come and help. We need help really on this uh, on this side of uh, of the work. We have a lot of data that needs to be posted. Any more questions? Yeah, I have any other questions? Any other questions? Single line. Uh, I don't. I don't think there's anything online. You have. Uh, I, I have for your like this. Uh, you know, honeycomb structure. You make some smaller ones, some larger ones. Yes. But that might not actually be the ideal. You know, honeycomb might not be the best thing to get the best structure out of that. The honeycomb not being right. Exist. I mean, I could think about any crazy types of structure for this yes. part. Right. Yes. So, so have you thought about you know? I don't know. Going yeah. Uh, no, but actually. To answer your question, I hope that this answers your question. Oh, you had those things. This, uh, yeah. You know, better ones, you got different. Image. You can see these are different. This is hexagon, right? Yeah. Different shapes. So yes. But but I mean, what I, I mean is like it's still like repeating pattern, right? I could have maybe oh, some crazy designs. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Uh, so that work was about the ready structure design. Mm -hmm. I think what you're referring to is more like structural design. Yeah. We do spend quite some effort on structural optimization. Yeah. Uh, Reddit is just one. Um, there, we, we also investigate a lot of organic shape as well. Uh, it depends on the application. So some applications require um, energy absorption under impact. In that case, we consider a oxidic structure so that they can have negative Poisson ratio when it's under impact so they can serve more energy. So it depends on the on the application. We choose different uh, structures. So basically, on on FEA or on on the digital world, you can do whatever you want, right? So Pam can come with whatever ideas that he wants to come up with, and then he comes to me. I want the experimentalist guy, and then it's like it's not manufactured. So you see, this is just, this is the thing. It is just uh, right. it is just like yes, we can come up with whatever origami ideas and stuff. Like that. I hear it all, right? But at the end of the day, would it be manufacturable or not? And even if it is manufacturable, this is the main aim of, I hope that the only takeaway that I want to give to you as researchers over here is, can you scale it up, right? So because as an engineer, especially when we go to academia, we just think about the low you level it? and yes, and yes, we can do it, but can be scaled, right? Somebody who hears, not in a bad way, right? But who cares? Because one of the, my first encounters as a graduate student, after spending a lot of effort for six months doing research and stuff like that, I went to an open house uh, uh, at Tuskegee University, right? A booster session, stuff like that. And I was just fresh out of the board, right? Good, uh, just came from abroad, coming to United States, do good research. And then I started like, uh, the referee come and ask me a lot of questions and I answered all of them and I was very excited. And at the end, by the way, they said like, who cares? And I kid you not, it breaks me. It broke me because I was doing very fundamental issues and I didn't think about the scalability at the time. And I went to my supervisor and he's raging. It's like, it's a science for sake of science and this and that. It's like, hey, 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 chill, right? He, he has a point in one thing is like, Sometimes the fundamental sciences are good by itself, but then engineering manufacturing world, I'm not, please don't take my thing as a blanket statement. Mathematician, physicist, without them and their fundamental work, we will not be in a lot of advancement, right? But I'm talking all of this in manufacturing. If you are in manufacturing and nobody cares at the end and you can give it to him in a form or another that it can be integrated, then it would be at the lab and it will never go somewhere else. It's good for the science. 
till somebody come and do this research. Because this is the thing, I'm not saying that it is bad. It will sit there till one like you or me or, or you folks come and think about like, this is a good fundamental. This is a good theory level. Let's give it to Boeing, mm. right? So this is the science that we are, this is what I'm promoting, not, not anything else. Is, is, is that transfer happening, I guess, with the, because the scalability that you guys have shown is remarkable. Yeah. Right. And then, so I'm, I'm wondering about industry, right? And, um, are they trying to leverage some of the scalability? So that you're demonstrating? Most of the thing that you saw today, you will see a patent or something on it, right? Or industry partner. So most of our work is licensed uh, by these companies because we work with them from day one. We say like, hey, by the way, we have this cool ideas. What are the specs? So the very first thing that I showed on the material slide was Boeing specs, right? And then we work backward from there, right? To be able to implement these. So to your point, the large scale additive manufacturing, it existed in our group back in 2014. Right now, uh, Boeing has a system, Lockheed Martin down the road over here, they have system, Spirit, they have system. So from, from just like you see a fundamental issue or fundamental problem, now a lot of companies, they have the technology sitting on their floor. So okay. I hope that this answers your question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think for the sake of time, I think I'm going to go ahead and end the session. But um, if you guys have additional I questions, please come down and, and speak to our talk to our speaker in person. I have time.